Part one. You will hear a man called Ken talking on the phone to a friend called Liz about holiday accommodation. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Hello. Hi, Liz. It's Ken here. Hi, Ken. Nice to hear from you. Are you? This is just a quick call. But Mary and I have just been talking about our summer holiday. We haven't booked a place yet, and we've left it a bit late. We were just wondering if you know of any holiday rentals in your area. It's so nice there. Well, yes, I can think of two or three places that are very nice. What dates have you got in mind? The tenth of July to the twenty-second of July. Oh yes, that is quite soon, isn't it? Well, there's a place near here called Moonfleet. Is that M O O N F L O O E T? That's right. It's quite a rural location, and it's next to the owner's house. But it's got fields all around it, so it's very pretty. Hmm. Sounds okay. Can you tell me a bit more about it? Well, it's an annex to the owner's house, and it's an apartment with two bedrooms. And an open-plan living area. Well, I like the sound of it. Is there anything we might not like about it? Well, it's quite a distance from the nearest shops. That's all. Okay. And well, I'll tell Mary, but I don't think she'd mind that. Do you know how you book it? You have to book on the internet. There's a web address. It's www. Summerhouses. One word. Yes. Then dot com. You'll be able to look at a photograph on that. Okay. And what about the others? Where are they? The second one I'm thinking of is called Kingfisher, and that's even more rural. It's a really beautiful location. In fact, it's by the river, and it's got nice views. It overlooks woodland on the other side. Is that an apartment? No, it's a three-bedroomed house. And that's got a dining room as well as a separate living room and a kitchen, but I expect it's more expensive. You'll have to check the prices. Hmm, it's probably a bit bigger than we need, but our nephew might be joining us. We're not sure yet. How do you book Kingfisher? You have to phone the owner directly. Shall I give you the number? I've got it here in my phone book. It's o one seven five two, double six nine. Two one eight. Right. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Now listen and answer questions seven to ten. And you mentioned a third place. Yes, there's a house that my sister stayed in last year. It's called Sunnybanks. Nice name. And the location of that one is rather different. It's in the centre of a village, but it's a very small and quaint place. Did your sister like it? Oh yes, it's by the sea, so her children really loved it. What's the accommodation like? I'm not sure about the number of rooms because I haven't been in it myself. But I think she said it's quite spacious, and I know it's got its own garden. It's not very big, but it's not shared with anyone else, and it's supposed to be very pretty. Any snags, problems? The only other thing I can think of is that there's nowhere for parking. The streets are too narrow, so you have to leave your car somewhere else. And then walk to the house. It's only about ten minutes away, but okay. 
Well, I don't think it matters personally. How do you book it? There's an agent you have to contact. I don't know his details, but I can ask my sister and let you know tomorrow. Thanks, Liz. That'd be great. I'll talk to Mary and see what she says. Thanks for your help. That's okay, Ken. I'll speak to you again tomorrow. I hope you find what you're looking for. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a man talking about living and working on Trinidad. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi, I'm Steve Pinfold and I'm here today to tell you about my gap year, which I took about 20 years ago. Unlike many students these days who go travelling or get some work experience between school and university, I decided to do something completely different after finishing my degree. I applied to work for a charity organisation. What it does is it sends people with particular skills to countries where those skills are needed. Apart from having some experience teaching English to summer school students, I didn't have any particularly useful skills, I thought, but luckily I was still accepted. I had to find the money for the flight, but you get free accommodation – I stayed with a family of five. And you do get paid, but not much. It's a bit like pocket money, enough to get by. I worked in an orphanage and taught English at a local school. Where was I? Well, originally, I was going to be sent to a village in India, but at the last minute, the organisation decided to send me to Trinidad. Now, this is a fascinating place. It's an island in the Caribbean. Well, in fact, the country is actually two islands. The smaller one is called Tobago, which is connected somehow to the word tobacco. Anyway, there I was, a young white guy living and working on an island which is mostly a mixture of descendants from Africa and India. The Africans were originally brought over as slaves, and the Indians came later as indentured workers. That means they agreed to come for a specific time, but many of them stayed. There are also some Trinidadians of Chinese and British origin, though the native inhabitants were basically wiped out by colonialization. I myself felt completely accepted and had the time of my life. The language everyone speaks is English, so there was no problem for me there, but some concepts don't quite translate. They're pure Trinidadian. There's the term liming, for example, which means sitting around watching the world go by. Also, there's the famous carnival, when the whole island is taken up in playing mass. For a whole month, around February or March, it depends when Easter is, Everyone's busy preparing costumes, practicing calypsos, soca and steel pan music, and most importantly, partying. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. When the actual official carnival starts, it's days of 24-hour dancing in the streets. In Trinidad, it's called whining. You've probably seen this sort of thing on TV, in the more famous carnival in Rio, or even at the Notting Hill Carnival in London. Many people joined bands, each one of which has a theme. For example, the sea or jungle fever, and they have costumes designed and made to go with the theme. These can cost $1,000 for the king and queen of each band. They're incredible. The whole city is a non-stop party zone full of colour and sound. It's serious, too. The bands are in competition, and the winner gets a million dollars. Sorry, I got a bit carried away with those memories. Back to my real job there. The orphanage was called St. Augustine's, and that's also the name of the place where it was, St. Augustine, a town just outside the capital city, Port of Spain. I didn't have any particular job description, just to be with the children and tell stories, sing songs and play games. Oh, and we also went camping in the jungle once. <laughs> I could tell you a few stories about that particular escapade. Every time I arrived at the gate, kids would come running towards me, shouting, with big smiles on their faces. The younger children seemed fascinated by my blonde hair and loved to touch it as if it was something miraculous. The English teaching I did two days a week in a primary school for six to eleven-year-olds. The kids may have been poor, but they all wore neat and clean uniforms and were so respectful and enthusiastic. I've now been teaching for many years in different countries, and I still think those were the best students I've ever taught. What else did I do while I was there? I swam a lot. Can you imagine what it's like swimming with dolphins and with pelicans diving into the sea right next to you? More seriously, I trained to be a Samaritan. That's someone who listens and supports people who have problems with their lives. Overall, what I took from the experience was a sense of being in another culture, or rather cultures. As humans, we all share many characteristics, but we express ourselves in various ways. In Trinidad, there are lots of different communities and religions, and so many different kinds of festival to see. Hindu, Muslim, Christian, as well as some rather mysterious African traditions. There are quite a few Rastafarians, too. Trinidad is, as Americans are fond of saying of their own country, a melting pot, where everybody is greeted warmly. Go and see for yourself. I'm not sure how it's changed since I was there, but I'd love to find out. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. The next important development in how history is recorded came with print. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. The next important development in how history is recorded came with print. In the 8th century, the Chinese invented paper and woodblock printing. Remember that up to this time, very few people could read and write, 
and so only a very small number of people could understand written history. Suddenly, many books appeared, and many more people learnt to read. In the 14th century, the first printing press was invented in Germany. This reduced how long it took to produce books. The new printing technique quickly spread to other parts of the world. More books appeared, and even more people learnt to read. The first printed newspaper appeared in 1605, and the first daily newspaper in 1702. Now, people could read news stories soon after the event happened, and every event was recorded and stored. The problem with newspaper history is that newspaper reporters could tell the stories they wanted to tell, and not necessarily the truth. Photography was the next important development. We generally agree that photography was born in 1839. Some of the earliest photographs that the public saw were images of the American Civil War. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. People were shocked by the photographs of dead soldiers and for the first time saw the reality of war. By 1850, photographs appeared regularly in newspapers and people now expected the truth. At the end of the 19th century came the first motion picture camera. Soon, history was being recorded as moving images. In the 1930s, television brought moving images into people's homes. More and more people saw history as it happened, and more and more history was recorded. Today, of course, we expect that every event in the world is recorded. Satellite TV and the internet allow people to watch any event. Anywhere in the world, as it happens. It doesn't matter if the TV cameras are not there. People carry around mobile phones and can record any incident and then share it online. Families have their own video cameras and record their own history. Children now grow up watching their parents and grandparents on film. I'm sure you'll agree that the transition from storytelling to what we have today has been dramatic. And I hope that. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about how adults and babies communicate. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hi, I'm Emma Bailey and today I'm going to be talking baby talk. Hopefully you'll find the subject interesting rather than infantile. I'd like to start by getting you to imagine a scenario. You're in an office or at a family gathering when a mother comes in with her young baby. Like everyone else, you want to see the mother and baby and you probably want to talk to the baby. How do you do this? What kind of language do you use? Recent research has shown that adults all talk to babies in similar ways. They repeat phrases over and over again in a high-pitched sing-song voice with long vowel sounds. And if they ask questions, they exaggerate their intonation. Researchers have discovered that this kind of language, which they have called motherese, is used by adults all over the world when they talk to babies. And according to a new theory, motherese forms a kind of framework for the development of language in children. This baby talk, so the theory goes, itself originated as a response to another aspect of human evolution, walking upright. In contrast to other primates, humans give birth to babies that are relatively undeveloped. So, whereas a baby chimpanzee can hold on to its four-legged mother and ride along on her back shortly after birth, helpless human babies have to be held and carried everywhere by their upright mothers. Having to hold on to an infant constantly would have made it more difficult for the mother to gather food. In this situation, researchers suggest, human mothers began putting their babies down beside them while gathering food. To pacify an infant distressed by this separation, the mother would talk to her offspring and continue her search for food. This remote communication system could have marked the start of mother ease. As mothers increasingly relied on their voices to control the emotions of their babies and later the actions of their mobile juveniles, words emerged from the jumble of sounds and became conventionalised across human communities, ultimately producing language. Not all anthropologists, however, accept the assumption that early human mothers put their children down when they were looking for food. They point out that even modern parents do not do this. Instead, they prefer to hold their babies in their arms or carry them around in slings. They suggest that early mothers probably made slings of some kind, both for ease of transportation and to keep their babies warm by holding them close to their bodies. If this was the case, they would not have needed to develop a way of comforting or controlling their babies from a distance. It's not only anthropologists, but also linguists who challenge this explanation for how language developed. They say that although the mother ease theory may account for the development of speech, it does not explain the development of grammar. Nor, they say, does it explain how the sounds that mothers made acquired their meaning. Most experts believe that language is a relatively modern invention that appeared in the last 100,000 years or so. But if the latest theory is right, baby talk, and perhaps fully evolved language, was spoken much earlier than that. We know that humans were walking upright one and a half million years ago. This means that mothers may have been putting their babies down at this time and communicating with them in mother ease. We can be sure that this is not the end of the story, as anthropologists and linguists will continue to investigate the origins of this most human of abilities, language. That is the end of part four.